keep track where we're at. We're going to be in Acts chapter 8, book of Acts chapter 8. Got a couple over here on this side that need them. And before we would do that, let's go to the Lord and ask Him to bless this time of Bible study. Heavenly Father, God, we come before you, and we do. We open up our hearts and minds to receive all that you have for us. Lord, that we would come to the place of recognizing just how much you want to interact in the day-to-day aspects of our lives. Oh, Lord, it's not just that you're a go-to in times of trouble, but, Lord, you're a friend and one that we can walk with in companionship and in love and even in intimacy. We can walk and share our closest kept secrets with you, knowing that you'll never dishonor us as we honor you. And so, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity that we have to come to your house to study your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. It has been said that what doesn't kill you makes you what? Stronger. But it's amazing what you can live through, isn't it? But the idea being that hardships and trials, those that we would survive, they serve to make us stronger and to grow in the things of the Lord. And often it's hardship which is the only thing that can bring us from one place to another. And that's exactly what we see happening in this 8th chapter of the book of Acts. The church is growing, but it's not without opposition. Stephen has just been martyred. Well, you could say just been murdered. And the man who supervised his execution is now set on destroying this new religion called the Way, the Christians that have risen out of this following of Jesus Christ. The name of this man is Saul. And he is expecting at all of his efforts to be able to destroy this new church, this new uprising, in order to take and to eliminate it completely from the landscape. But what he doesn't understand is what he's going to do, in effect, is cause God's plan of furthering the gospel to be accelerated. I love it when God uses the efforts of those who would think that they would work against God actually in his favor. The other thing that Saul doesn't know is that he's going to get a name change a little bit down the road. And we'll see how that works when God gets a hold of him personally. But in verse 1 of chapter 8, it says, Now Saul was consenting to his death being Stephen's death. At the time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea, Samaria, except the apostles. Now, to say that Saul was consenting is a bit of an understatement. He was a Pharisee of Pharisee. He was part of the Sanhedrin. And for him to be present at the stoning of Stephen means that he not only consented, he was, well, sanctioning it. It says that the men took their coats coats and cloaks and they laid them at this young Pharisee's feet. And so for him to be there and say, well, he consented, it sounds like he just gave permission. No, he was the authority behind the killing of Stephen. Saul himself will talk about this later on as Paul, when he talks about the zealousness of which he went after the attacking of and the potential removal of Christianity. But it was the same zealousness, the same conviction that drove him to do the things that he did against the church that God would use to spread the gospel throughout the entire world. Stephen's death had opened a floodgate. A floodgate literally of violence against Christians. The apostles, though, they had the support of the people. And in Jerusalem, they had somewhat of a bubble, if you will. They were protected by the number of people that were there, at least for the time being. And so Saul's strategy became one to attack the growth. He decided to go after the followers rather than the leaders because, well, they were much softer targets. And I don't know about you, but there's a lot of times when I wonder why it is that God allows His children to suffer. Why it is that He allows things to happen that would seem unfair or even maybe unjust. But what we don't often see is we don't realize that God is working in a plan that is much bigger than we could ever imagine. We don't recognize and realize that the effects of what is happening in one circumstance is going to have a totally different impact upon the kingdom of heaven and while there's countless examples that we could look at one of one that really caught my mind as a as a young christian and it had to do with the fact that i was blessed to attend a a a session with one of the primary individuals and i'll introduce her to you in just a moment had to do with the death of five missionary men 
It was back in 1956, and there was a group of five families that were working to bring the gospel to the jungles of Ecuador when all five of the men that fathered these families were murdered by native tribesmen. It seemed to many to be totally senseless and unreasonable as many saw just the murder of five good men and then all of the widows and the children that were left behind. What a wasted effort on these guys' parts to go into an area only to find themselves murdered and martyred, if you will, for the gospel. You see, God had another plan. A plan that no one could have seen at the time that this was taking place. And it's why it's so important that when we see something happen that we don't rush to judge it as good or bad. We just rush to trust the Lord in the circumstances of what it is that He's bringing. You see, the deaths of these men, that entire region of Ecuador, came to know Jesus Christ as the Lord and Savior. Actually, up into and including the very men that took the lives of the five missionaries, got saved, came to know the Lord, came to be family friends, one of them referred to by one of the sons of the kilt leader of this as grandfather, a relationship that started out of a terrible tragedy. The murder of your father wound up giving in this man's life, in this individual's life, this Steve Saint by his name, a grandfather who had started out as the murderer of his own father. The account has been brought into books and movies because it's also the account of Elizabeth Elliot and her husband. And many of you are familiar with the story. It's called The End of the Spear. And if you get a chance, go up and look at it. It's an amazing read. It's an amazing opportunity to see exactly how this worked. But the thing that blew me away about this was that this was something that anybody would look at and go, this is wrong. This is out of space. These guys are working for the Lord. They're in this place doing what the Lord has called them to do. And all of a sudden, they wind up being killed for by, by, by virtue of following God's direction. Now, they would not have been able to see this side of heaven, any of that result. But his family was able to. And because of that one event, countless thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people across the world have come to know Jesus Christ because of the testimony of these five men's sacrifice and what God did in relationship to their offering. The same way people often look at the death of Stephen and they go, what a waste. This guy was a young evangelist. He was full of the Spirit of God. He had great oracle skills he was able or orative skills he was able to talk and to speak and he would have been such a great influence and yet he was cut down before he even got started and yet it was through this event that the church was forced to do something it had been reluctant to do oh you know we talked about how jesus had told them that part of their commission was to what go Go to Judea, go to Samaria, go to the outer parts of the world. Jerusalem was the starting point, and up to this point in time, they had formed an amazing megachurch in Jerusalem. And it was great, and they were having huge services, and 3,000 and 5,000 men were coming, and people were getting saved, and it was great, and they had this great big, huge promotional system going on in Jerusalem. But they weren't going out. And all of a sudden, God decides that he's going to use this process of Stephen's death to bring apart bring about persecution that drives them to the very place that he wants them to go. God uses hardship. If we were to take and do a survey, everybody here at some point in time can look back and either know within your own life or know within the lives of others that you've observed where God has used something that was caused to push somebody in a direction that they would not have otherwise gone. You know, when things are going really great, we have a tendency not to think that anything can change or needs to. I mean, if everything's going great, if, everything, if everything's you know, just, just, just the way that I like it, the last thing I want to do is change anything, right? How many of you in here are willing to admit that you hate change for that reason? I just finally got it working the way I want, leave it alone. And God comes in and goes, no. Let's set a fire where you are so that you've got to evacuate and find yourself in the place where I want you to be more so than the place that you've become comfortable what happens is, is that difficult circumstances will bring us to the place of being led into something that we never otherwise would have found our path in or would have ever thought was a potential open door. And while we may never know the results this side of heaven, what we can do is stand on what we do know. What I will always know, what we can always know, is that God 
loves us. Regardless of the circumstances that we're in, regardless of if it's uphill, downhill, or sideways, regardless of, of what's happening in the surrounding circumstances of our life, God always loves us. He will never leave or forsake us. You see, we can hold on to what we know even when we don't know what is coming around the corner. We can also know that God wants to use us continually in the advancement of His kingdom. Oh, what does that mean? That we can only do that when things are going really, really good. When everything's going our way and when everything is, 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 is moving in the direction that we want it to move, then we want to be used of the Lord. Well, sometimes it's just the opposite. Sometimes what happens is that makes us too comfortable and too complacent and we wind up not doing anything. And God says, let's get you moving a little bit. Let's turn up the heat a little bit. Let's, let's cause you to be a little uncomfortable so something will change. We also know, and we're promised, that some things work together for good. Oh, yes, wait, somebody, somebody better say, <laughs> stop me! <laughs> All things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. Oh, I, I would rather have it be that most things work together good when God does things my way. <laughs> Wouldn't you? But see, that's not what it says. Yeah, first, first Gary <laughs> in, in the book of hallucinations. <sighs> and devout men carried Stephen to his burial. And they made great lamentations over him. Now, this is interesting because, you see, it was against Jewish law for them to take and to celebrate or to wail or to moan or mourn over an individual who had been executed. But this demonstrates so clearly that they saw that the death of Stephen was not justified. And we talked about how the Jews that had called, his, called for his, his, his execution had done so that was not only against Roman law, but obviously against that which God would have prescribed. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Saul went after the church, and he did so with great violence. As a matter of fact, this word havoc in the original language talks about an animal literally tearing at its prey. I mean, this wasn't something that was just, oh, let's go wind up, round up some people and put them in prison. They were jerking people out of their houses. They were dragging them and putting them in change and taking them to prison. And the idea here is not only just the men, but Saul was seeking to destroy and punish the entire family to obliviate it by removing both men and women from the scene and imprisoning them. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. How strange. You would think that therefore those who were Christians went underground and started hiding and wanted to make sure that they stayed concealed. But it says, no, that they were scattered and everywhere they went that they shared the word. And that's a better understanding. They, they weren't sent out as, as, as missionaries preaching the world. They were, they were sent out as exiles and unwilling to begin with missionaries, but found that they could not keep from talking about Jesus Christ. And because of what Saul was doing, I love this. Because he was now emboldened after the death and the stoning of Stephen to go after the church even more, and he starts taking people out of their homes, that it causes people to become uncomfortable, not feel safe where they're at, so they flee. But everywhere they go, they talk about Jesus Christ. I can imagine how frustrating this was for Saul. I mean, he just realized that what he did is he just opened up this can of worms. It was all contained in Jerusalem, and now what's happened is, is that this thing is spreading, and it's going even further and further. And it is interesting that rather than being silent as they were being forced out, they spoke out. Because one of the greatest weapons of the enemy is to silence the people of God. You guys realize that? He works hard to shame Christians. There's a lot of that going on right now. There's a lot of that that's happening in relationship to what we see happening in our culture and the whole idea of this cancel culture aspect and everything else that's going on to where, where the idea of having a set of standards in which you adhere to, a set of standards that come from the principles of God in His Word, that which is, is trustworthy for us has been seen and promoted by the world as being anything but. And we're the problem. How dare you call yourself a Christian when you won't go along with things that are against the Word of God? Well, it's amazing how that's happening, isn't it? 
But folks, we should never be afraid to talk about Jesus, especially in a world where nothing is off limits. I mean, have you noticed that, you know, there used to be things that people didn't talk about in public. There used to be things that were, were known but not shared, not celebrated, not promoted, not something that was out there. Now it's like the only thing that you really can't talk about is God in the sense of Christianity and Jesus Christ. That's the only one that's off limits. Everything else is okay. And as a matter of fact, if you talk about God, you're the problem. Well, that just shows you that it's got to be true because the only thing that people would go after with such violence and with such, such ferocity is the truth that stands in opposition to their lie. And it's so hard to, to sit back and to watch and to see these things happening. And it causes me great concern when I look at the younger generation that's coming up now and those that will come in the future should the Lord tarry. And the reason that it distresses me is because I, I, I believe that there is such a difference in the time that I grew up and you grew up in the things that are happening right now. Now understand, evil has been there since the beginning of time. And if you've been here on our, on our Wednesday night studies when we're looking at, at Ezekiel and Jeremiah and we're going through the Old Testament, you know man's nature hasn't changed. Nothing is new under the sun. But the conditions under which those things are, are happening does change from generation to generation. When I grew up, it was still okay to go to church on Sundays. Matter of fact, I didn't have a choice, right? I tell people I had a drug problem. I was drugged to church every Sunday. In the morning, in the afternoon, every Wednesday, I was drugged to church. If there was something going on at the church, if the pastor was there washing the windows, I got drugged to church to watch him. Something happened in the church, we were going to be there. Now there's almost this stigma attached to the church that if you go in there, there's something wrong with you. You're closed-minded, you're a bigot, you're, you're, you're a hater. And guys, what you don't realize, and what I didn't realize until really started looking at it more and more, how this is being so forced and so crammed down the throats of our youth that they don't feel like they can make a stand. They don't feel like they have the opportunity because if they were to take a stand, what's going to happen is they're going to find themselves being shunned, find themselves being canceled by the culture as insignificant. And it's difficult enough for young people. I mean, I don't know about you, but when I was younger, I, I, I kind of liked people to like me. Do you have that problem too? I can't imagine what it's like for these youth that would try to take and make a stand in a science class or try to make a stand in a, in a, in a class that talks about cultural issues of the day and try to stand up and, and, and have, a, have a godly point of view and a god, godly worldview of things when, they're, when everything that they're being taught is completely against them. And this is one of the reasons why we, as those that would be, be the overseers and those that would be the, the shepherds of these youngsters coming up, need to give them such a strong example. We need to give them such a strong example. And then we need to recognize and allow them to recognize that they can't do it without the aid of heaven and they don't have to do it without the aid of brothers and sisters and, and spiritual fathers and spiritual grandfathers and mothers that will help them and, and bring them into this place of awareness so that they truly have something to stand on. And if you think for a moment that they're not up against conditions that are so far beyond our understanding, you need to wake up. I can't believe the stuff that's being taught but I see it in the eyes and in the confusion and in the broken hearts of kids that have no hope because everything that they want to believe they're told is not trustworthy in favor of everything that they would choose not to believe. It says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and he preached Christ to them, and the multitudes with one accord healed heeded these things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. Philip was another who had been chosen to wait tables. Remember when we saw the apostles talk about how it wasn't good for them to have to administrate all of the welfare programs and stuff. So they went out and said that they grew, grabbed a group of men who were filled with the Spirit, who were, who were those who were devoted to the Lord, and they brought them in, and they were all Gentiles. It was amazing, because the complaint was is that the Hebrews were, were disregarding the Gentile widows. And yet now we see this individual being forced out of Jerusalem finds himself in, of all places, Samaria. Samaria! Samaria. 
600 years before this time, the Assyrians had conquered this area. And what they did is they went in and they deported all of the Jews who were wealthy or educated. The cream of the crop. Anybody that had anything going on, tradesmen and craftsmen, and anything that could potentially benefit their kingdom, they took those folks into captivity. And then what they did is they moved in a whole bunch of pagan people groups into the land. And this was one of the strategies for conquering an area. You go in there and you diffuse and you break it up and you take away those that would potentially withstand against you or, or rise up against you. And then you infiltrate that area with something that makes them lose their culture. And this is what had happened in Samaria. These pagan people groups that were brought in were marrying with those that were left of the Jews and it created this, well, according to the true Jew, a half-breed a half-breed that was corrupted in their worship of God. And there was this great, deep-seated prejudice against them. And this is what makes the interaction that we see between Jesus and the woman at the well, who was a Samaritan, so amazing. Because Jesus sat down with her. If you remember, she even questioned, why are you being a Jew? or even, Why are you even talking to me? And then Jesus asked her to do something for her. A Jew wouldn't give a Samaritan a time of day. And yet... Jesus ministered to her. I believe that it was Jesus' interaction and the fact that she went back and told everyone what she had seen that opened the door to see Philip come in and do what he was going to do in his ministry. It says, But there was a certain man called Simon who previously practiced sorcery in the city and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he was someone great, to whom they all gave heed from at least to, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And they heeded him because he had astonished them with his sorceries for a long time. So we've got Philip in Samaria, and while he's there, comes on the scene Simon. Now, Simon had a reputation as being one with great power, he was a magician. He was a sorcerer. He was, he was one who used trickery, who was able to astonish the people so much so that the people thought that literally the power of God was contained within him. But we also know that anytime we see this aspect of sorcery and this type of activity in the Scripture, that it's linked to the occult, that it's linked to a power that's anything but God. And I believe that such is the case that we need to be aware of today, that there's a lot of sources of power in the world. A lot of powerful sources out there. And while none compare to God, there's those that are very, very convincing and very, very captivating, and it will cause people to be drawn to them. And it's one of the reasons why you can take and, and, and so easily pull somebody off the mark of what the truth is by using a part of a truth and then leading them into a lie. And if the truth is astonishing enough, if the, if the truth brings them to the place of buying the lie, then they will give over fully to the lie. And guys, we see that everywhere. It's no different than what was happening here. But the reality is, is if something is of God, listen, if something is of God, and I've got people all the time, okay, well, have you heard this guy? Have you read this guy's book? Did you see what this guy's doing? Did you see what's happening over here in this movement or that movement? Have you, have you checked out what's happening over here? Man, I was watching this thing on, on YouTube the other day, and this guy's got, he was doing, and this is, and I'm like, okay, stop. <laughs> Who got the glory? What do you mean? Who got the glory? Did what they do, what they subscribe to do, follow and bear out based on what we see in the Word of God? Well, no, this is a new thing. Ah. Where in the Word of God does it show this activity happening? Where do we see Jesus speaking about it, the apostles practicing it? Where do we see this being something that is given to us in the Word of God that would allow us to be able to say this is a work of God because it's been given to us in the Word of God? If it's not there, then the other thing we've got to look at is where does the glory go? Is the glory going to the organization, the individual? Is the individual being touted as being Simon? who has great power and great charisma and great ability to astonish them? Oh, he's great. No, God's great. God's the only one that's great. And if the power and if the glory is going anywhere else other than to God, other than to His Word, other than to His Son, Jesus Christ, it's not of God. End of case. It's that simple. It's what God's Word says. 
So if somebody's astonishing the masses, what I do is I look for, okay, where's the glory? Who gets it? And does it align with the Word of God? And if it can't pass that simple test, moving on. It's not of God. Amen? But when they believed Philip as he preached these things concerning the kingdom of God, and the same, in the name of Jesus Christ, see that, here's the astonishing thing, more so than Simon, it says both men and women were baptized. Then Simon himself also believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and was amazed seeing the miracles and the sign which were done. People come to salvation in Jesus Christ when Jesus Christ is preached. It's that simple. When we preach Jesus Christ, when we talk about Him being the only way, the only truth, the only life, when we are taking and willing to say that Jesus is the only way, that's when people become saved in the name of Jesus Christ, which is the only way in which we can be saved. But what's interesting is Simon also confesses that he believes. He gets baptized and he's following Philip. And it says, Now when the apostles who were in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received word of God, they sent Peter and John down. Oh, they're bringing in the big guns. Philip's got revival going on down there. Let's send in the big guns, man. Let's send in the, the professionals, right? And when they had come down, they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For they had yet, for as yet, he had not fallen upon them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. It's an amazing event. First off, we've we, we got to look at something that's happening here. The Samaritans had been rejected by God's people. They were outcasts. They were half-breeds. They were unworthy to receive. And yet one of the first places that we see outside of Jerusalem, the word of God being extended, the salvation of God, being extended to a people group that's in Samaria. The very place that had been shunned is now being welcomed. We also see here what is a subsequent empowering of the Holy Spirit that's separate from salvation. It says that they were saved and that they were baptized, but now what we're seeing is that at, the, at this time of salvation, at the time of the baptism, the Spirit had yet to come and empower them for service and for ministry, and yet this is what's happening now and being made Manifest as the apostles come and they lay hands. Now, understand there's a progression of the Holy Spirit. And we went through this in great detail in one of our previous teachings where we talked about before you come to salvation in Jesus Christ that the Holy Spirit walks alongside you. Walks alongside. And, and is constantly, I, I kind of I kind of see him as constantly nudging you. Hey, come on. Come on, man. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. It's not Jiminy Cricket on your shoulder. It's not your conscience. It's the Holy Spirit that is trying to guide and direct you into the, the place that Jesus wants you to come to receive salvation. And then when we do, when we finally give ourselves over to the Lord and by faith plus place our trust in Him for salvation, it says the Spirit comes to dwell within us. That He comes and He lives in us. Now our spirit becomes alive to the Spirit of God. We now can have communion with God that we could not have had in any other way. Because our spirit now is in company of the Holy Spirit of God within us. Oh, but then there's also a providing of power. There's a coming upon. There's a filling of the Holy Spirit, often called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, in which we receive power from God and from His Spirit to be witnesses, bold witnesses of Jesus Christ. Oh, in the Old Testament, we saw this as a coming and going kind of thing, but we also see it as being an empowering. And there's times when we're going to see in our lives that as we would allow the Spirit to speak, as we would yield ourselves to Him, that we're going to be able to do things that we could not have otherwise done. And it's amazing when it happens. Oh, and it's not something that is normally crazy. It's something that normally points directly at Jesus Christ, and it's something that is far above our pay grade. But because we yield and we're willing, the Holy Spirit comes along and empowers us. The event here is tied to the laying on of hands. And understand, we practice this aspect of laying on of hands. And the laying on of hands is not that the power is in the hand in which it's, it, it's, it's being administered by. It's a confirmation. It is an agreement of what it is that God is doing. When we bring up men up here and, and we say that these men are going to be serving in the capacity of elders and we lay hands on them and we pray for them, there isn't anything that's in my hands that's being released. 
But what we're saying is, is that we're willing to take and we're seeing God work in the lives of this person. And I, I want to touch that. <laughs> I want to be a part of that. We want to be one in that aspect of doing that. But see, that's not how it's taken because this observer, Simon, he sees something in this. And look at what it says in 18. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of hands, the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also that anyone whom I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. Simon's heart is revealed. And also along with it, what we could commonly refer and accept is, well, what was most likely a false conversion of Simon. He didn't really want the Holy Spirit for himself. He didn't really want to yield himself to the things of God. He didn't really want to place his faith in God. What he was looking for was more power and more control. His parlor tricks and his incantations and his, his magical prowess as a sorcerer was being overshone by this power of God. And it was a power that was significantly greater than his. He wanted to tap into the power because he didn't want to give up what he had achieved for his own glory. His sin? Pride. Wanting to possess the power of God, not to the honor of God but for his own personal gain. But Peter said to him, Your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. You have neither part nor portion in this matter, for your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Man, everybody needs a little Peter in your life, don't we? <laughs> Peter's going to call it just as, as the, the Holy Spirit downloads the hymn. And we know that this isn't the first time where Peter uses a word of knowledge, where something is given to him so that he can look into the circumstance and see it clearly for what it is. And it's obvious that Peter also doesn't use this as an opportunity to out. To, to, to out this wickedness, to cast it out, because even though Simon is obviously under the influence of something that is other than God, a demonic influence, he doesn't use his authority as an apostle to try to clean up Simon. Instead, he says, Simon, you need to repent. See, this was Simon's problem. This was Simon's problem. Simon had a certain aspect of pride. He calls him to, to righteousness, and he gives, though, this instruction that it's on him to take and to turn his life in the direction that God would have him to go. Now, here's the scary part. All outward appearances. Simon had done everything he was supposed to. Simon went to church. Simon came down front, said the sinner's prayer. Simon went out and got baptized. Simon is hanging out with Philip. All right. For all potential, if Philip would have seen a problem, I'm sure Philip would have addressed it. This guy was was moving within and amongst the sheep. And what they didn't realize is that there was a wolf in the pack. That there was one that had not gone in under the right circumstances. He had not gone in for the right reasons. His motivations had nothing to do with him actually giving over himself in faith to Jesus Christ to receive salvation. He wanted the power. And it's hard because we see this happen even within the church today. And guys, i got to tell you what, there's times when, when people come into the church and, and you watch and you see, and there's times when God will, will download this aspect of saying, hey, watch out for this guy. Not what he appears to be. Not what, not what they're promoting. They're, they're in this for other reasons. There's other motivations. There's other reasons that are driving this. And if you wait long enough and if you allow, and it's one of the reasons why, especially in this fellowship, one of the things that we do is we take the advice of Scripture very, very seriously. When it says, don't lay hands on too quickly. I mean, that's an admonishment. And the idea, again, is, is don't recognize this, that God is working in somebody who hasn't been tested and proven by the things of God. Oh, because it's, it's hard sometimes, especially when you're in a little church and you're out in the middle of Dayton. <laughs> On the road less traveled. We're going to see that in a minute, too. South road to Gaza. It's kind of like the south road to Dayton. Where somebody will come in and just thinks, I mean, they just look like they're exactly what, what, what the Lord should bring and should provide. 
I'm sure that to this church that was starting in Samaria, Simon looked like the best convert, convert ever, man. He came in, he got saved, he had all this notoriety, all these other people that had known him and been astonished for him. Or now, I mean, this, guy, this guy's a great asset to the church because his testimony in itself is going to draw people. And what the Lord says and what we're told to do is don't be too quick to have somebody rise to a level of being in a position of leadership until they've been tested, until they've been proven. And that's one of the reasons some folks get frustrated when they come to this church. Because, you know, if you come here, we want everybody to serve. We want everybody to be involved. Everybody that's sitting here today should have filled out a ministry team application. <laughs> we will be handing them out at the door on your way out. <laughs> yeah, especially for a drummer. Yeah, I don't know, you guys keep using that guy that shows up every once in a while. I don't know what his deal is. <sighs> but at the same time, some folks will come in and they're new to us and we're new to them and they'll be here for a week and a half and they already want to be in a position that would require there to be testing to go along with that. And we say, you know, just hang out for a while. If this is where the Lord wants you to be, just come and, and hang out. Come in and spend three five, six months, just be a part of the family. Become known and get to know people and just become a part of what God is doing here so that you know that if God is really truly calling you to be here, that when things don't go your way, you'll stay. Because that's how it works. And unfortunately, a percentage of those that come in and have a desire are like, well, if I can't do it right now, I'm leaving. I've literally had guys come in and within the second week that they were here within the fellowship, in this fellowship, come to me and told me that the Lord told them they were supposed to come up and preach instead of me. <laughs> and I looked at him and I went, no. <laughs> no, not going to happen. Right? Well, if you're not going to listen to God, then I'm going to leave. And I said, good. <laughs> Let me show you the door. Simons, and they infiltrate the church, and they infiltrate. Now, is it possible that Simon believed that Jesus was who he said he was? Yes. Is it possible that he believed that he needed intellectually the forgiveness of his sins, and, and, and that somehow or another would bring him into the place of power? Yes. It's very possible that that was the case. But what he didn't do is he didn't exercise faith in Jesus Christ as the one that forgave his sins and placed his dependency upon him as Lord and Savior. So if you want to never be in that place where you're worried about being a Simon, <laughs> why am I going to church? Am I just there because it's a great place and they have good company and, and it's a neat place to go? No. If you want to know, just make sure that you've taken and given everything over in your heart to Jesus. Let him be in charge and ask him to send by the power of the Spirit his confirmation to your heart. Amen? Then Simon answered and said to him, Pray to the Lord for me, that none of these things which you have spoken may come upon me. And this is sad because the response that Peter was looking for and would have probably been the right response would have been for Simon to humble himself, repent, and ask for forgiveness. And instead he says, Hey, you pray for me. You make it happen. But guys, understand that change will only come in the heart of of one who chooses or would choose to receive Jesus Christ when they place their faith in Christ, when they pray to receive. No other than a prayer from a repentant heart can provide salvation to that heart. Amen? We don't know what happened to Simon. There's some church tradition that says that he went off the deep end and he actually became a televangelist. had two jets, flew around the country. Yeah, no, that, but he was, a, he was trouble to the early church because he became a false teacher. He had charisma. He had the ability. And guys, I wonder, sometimes when we look and we, we see what's happening again, the test is always, does it align with the Word of God and who gets, who gets the glory? And if that's not present, then we have to be careful that we would just see someone followed because of parlor tricks or personality or charisma. Always look to where the glory is pointed. So when they testif had testified and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go towards the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem 
to Gaza. In, or this is desert. So he arose and he went, and behold, a man from Ethiopia, a eunuch, a great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of her treasury and had come to Jerusalem to worship, was worshiping and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. This is another one of those doesn't make sense moments. Philip just launched this incredible new work in Samaria. He took and, and, and planted a church and it was growing like crazy and they had all of this new energy and this new effort and everything that was going around. And now the Lord comes to him and, and, and says, I want you to go to Dayton. I want you to go to the South Way to Gaza, along the, the road less trans. It's out in the desert. It's out in the middle of nowhere. And guys, we have to understand that there are going to be times when God is going to do things and tell us to do things that don't make sense to us. Fifteen years ago, I was serving as the assistant pastor and a worship leader at Calvary Chapel in Carson City. We had just bought a piece of property had just cleared a three-phase building plan to start construction of a new building, the one now that you see on Clearview when you drive by in Carson City. I was the project manager along with everything else that I did. I was the one that was supposed to run around and make sure everything got done, the hiring of, of the, the, the contractors and all of the negotiations and all the oversight of the work and everything else, right? And the Lord came and He says, I want you to go to Dayton. I thought he was out of his mind. <laughs> Lord, you've got to be kidding. I mean, look at all of this stuff. This is going to be very detrimental to the church in Carson City. This is going to be really tough. This is going to be something that doesn't make sense. We've been working on getting out of these leased buildings for years. We finally have the property. We're, 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 we're growing on the place of being able to build a new building. Lord, isn't this what you want us to do? And, and guys, I'm not going to tell you that I responded well quickly. Because <laughs> I didn't. It didn't make sense. It didn't make any sense that God would interrupt this work that we had going on over here for something else. When we finally did come around to seeing it His way, what we found was that He was a lot more capable than we were. And there's two fellowships that are now dedicated to the Lord that are teaching the Word of God within this area. And we couldn't have seen that at that point in time. It didn't make sense. And so Philip is told to go to the desert. And what I like about Philip is he, he did it quickly. He says, he got right up and went. I'm going to try to do that the next time. <laughs> and he empowers this, or, or comes across this, this powerful emissary of Ethiopia. And there's this man who had converted to Judaism, obviously had come to Jerusalem to worship and had taken and made a great investment. Scrolls at that point in time were hard to come by. So if he was reading a copy of Isaiah, he had spent a lot of money to secure this copy of Isaiah. And he's sitting there and he's reading it. And the Lord says, run up to his chariot. So Philip ran up to him. And he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah. And he said, all right, we got to slow down just enough to take a look and see what's happening. Philip says yes. God says, I'm going to send you down on this lonely, deserted road. Philip says yes, and he gets there, and here's this wealthy guy sitting there in a chariot. Now, a chariot in that particular point in time would be likened to a limo. All right, so he shows up, and here's this guy sitting in a, in, in a limo on the side of the road, or maybe he's still rolling at some pace of speed because it says he ran to catch him, so I don't know if he actually had to run up and flag him down or not. But he's reading the book of Isaiah. God, without a doubt, had obviously orchestrated this whole meeting to put faith into and draw faith out of Philip. Now, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes we have a tendency to shrink away from those that are wealthy and influential. I mean, it's hard. I mean, rich and famous people very often are seen as being above needing anything. I mean, because they have so much, I mean, they themselves don't believe that they need anything because everything is provided to them in an earthly, earthly realm. 
But this is why Jesus also said that it's easier for a rich man to squeeze through the eye of a needle than it is to enter the kingdom of God. Because guys, understand, it doesn't matter if you're rich or if you're poor, if you're influential, if you're not, if you're significant or insignificant, it doesn't matter. Everyone, everyone needs Jesus Christ. So God created this door and he opened it up for Philip and Philip was willing not to walk through it, but run through it. And guys, one of the greatest things that we can do as a believer is we can ask God to provide open doors. We can ask him. And and, and I would be willing to venture and say that for many of us, this is someplace that's not necessarily something that we're, we're overly comfortable with. Because the problem is, is that if you ask God to do something in your life, then he normally does in a way that's different than what you thought you know i ask i used to ask for a download of patience i don't do that anymore because god never gives me patience he gives me opportunities to be patient ask the lord for courage in the face of the battle he doesn't give me just just a download of courage so that all of a sudden i start talking like arnold schwarzenegger i'm back i mean it doesn't work that way what he does is he gives me opportunities to be terrified so that I can trust him and grow through the process of realizing my courage comes from him. So we have to be very careful what we ask for, but if we ask for God to come and to give us the opportunities in order to be able to take and to minister the way that he would have us to do, he'll provide it. And he'll open doors to us. Now understand, as with Philip, It wasn't because of Philip's great ability. It was because Philip said yes. It wasn't because Philip was a great teacher. It wasn't because he was was a great and gifted individual in all of the different areas in which God could use. God says, no, I don't want your ability. I want your availability. And it's the same thing that he wants from us. He wants us to just be available. He wants us to say yes. He asked the man, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and to sit with him. What a great response. What a, what a great... <laughs> I'd love to just come across somebody that was reading the Bible and i said, what you reading? And he say, I don't know. Can you tell me what it means? <laughs> I'd love to have this. Wouldn't you? But God has purposed teachers and guides to be a part of the body of Christ. You know, it was years ago before I had really come and committed to the Lord. And understand, I grew up in a Christian home. I grew up knowing everything I thought I needed to know about God, about the church, about everything else. As a matter of fact, even as a a young man, when I quit going to church, I just figured I still knew who God was. I still understood that there was a God, but I figured if I ever needed him, I'd ask, and I don't need him because I got this all covered. Anybody else have that kind of experience? I got this, Lord. If I need you, I'll let you know. And the Lord let me run amok. He did. He let me run my life into the point of literally the brink of destruction before I finally realized that I needed to repent and I needed to accept things on his term. And when I did, he blessed me with a a set of friends and people that were around me that encouraged me to go to this church in Las Vegas called Calvary Chapel Spring Valley. And I went in and they had this this goofy-looking preacher guy. He was goofy-looking because he was about this tall, and he didn't look like any preacher. I grew up in a Baptist church. Now, if you were Southern Baptist, you know Southern Baptists had a particular look to them. All right? They always had suits on, right? And they always had the hair. <laughs> and whenever they said God, the hair would go, yeah, they had big hair, big, big presentation. I mean, that was my experience in Baptist church, at least in the region that I grew up in. And this guy had these little poodle curls, funny looking glasses, and he came out and just normal clothes, and he would stand up there and he would just open the Bible and he would teach it. And all of a sudden, because I had turned and opened my heart to the Lord and the Holy Spirit that now was dwelling within me started using that word and that instruction to the place that it changed my entire understanding of who God was. Because I knew everything about the church. I'd grown up in the church, but I had no idea who Jesus was. I had no idea who God as my father was until there was one that was called into this place to instruct. And so impressed that when the Spirit of God told me that I was to do the same thing, 
that I stand before you here today with the same heart, the same hope that the word that goes out will be that which you will understand, that you will translate, that you will take into your heart, that will change your life and your relationship with God to the place that you too will become a guide for someone else. The place in Scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life was taken from earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself or some other man? And then Philip opened his mouth and beginning at this scripture, preached Jesus to him. And now as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? (laughs) I love that. But Philip starts to answer this guy based on right where he is at the time. You see, he, he, he's in Isaiah, and so Philip goes right to the Scripture. He doesn't tell him about his church. He doesn't tell him that he needs to clean up his act. He doesn't tell him that he's a sinner and that he needs to, to repent of his sins. He doesn't go through any of this. He doesn't say that you need to stop doing the wrong things for the right things, all of which are not, there's nothing wrong with that. But what he does is he goes to the first things first, and what he does is he answers this guy's questions. And part of witnessing for Jesus, the part that sometimes we make more difficult than it is, is that we need to listen to what somebody is asking rather than just telling them what it is that we know that they need to know. And what I have found in talking with people is that they normally are dealing with something that is causing them to be drawn to the Word of God, calling them to be drawn to a, a, a follower of Jesus Christ because of what they see in us and because of some sort of sort of emotional defect or problem that they're having. And it really comes down to one of some pretty basic things. The first thing that I see is that they are lonely. Most people in this world can have lots of friends. There's a lot of people that are out there. There's people in this room right now that even though you're here, you're lonely. What you need to hear is that you're not alone that somebody does care. Not only does Jesus care, but those that are in Jesus Christ care about and love you, even without knowing you. People need to understand that they're not alone in this world. The other thing that they'll be concerned about, along with somebody that really cares, is that they're afraid that they're going to have to make a stand or they're going to have to go through this life by themselves. And they need to understand that they were never designed to go through this life by themselves. That they're not alone that they're not all by themselves. There's, there, there, there is this entire network of not only God's people that love them and that care for them, but there is a God that cares for them and goes beyond anything that the church itself can provide. And then finally, what I find more than anything else is people are confused. <laughs> people are confused. People want something that is true. They want to be able to stand on something that is based in truth that they can build their life in. And because of all the different noises and all the different voices and all of the different approaches to how to do this thing called life, they're confused. They need to be told there's some place that they can trust. And when we come to the point of understanding what it is that they're asking, if they're looking for the truth, if they're looking to know that they're not alone, if they really want to know that somebody cares and you can get to this place and answer that question first, then the opportunity to be able to share Jesus with them comes so much easier. And this is exactly what happens. And by the time Phyllis finishes, this man is saying, hey, I've accepted Jesus Christ. Can I be baptized? Can you think of a more difficult set of circumstances to witness in? go to the south road to Gaza and go run up and catch a rich man's chariot, explain to him what's happening in Isaiah. How many of you in here think that you could even explain anything out of Isaiah? Uh, We don't know where Philip was at. Philip went and he sat down and he listened to this guy And the guy said, hey, I've got some questions. And what does this mean? And who is this guy? And who is this guy talking about? And Philip answers his question. And the first thing that he does is he shares with him right where he's at, right in Scripture, that this is God's Word, and God's Word is talking about His Son, Jesus Christ. 
and he relies upon the Holy Spirit to bring us about. Then Philip says, if you believe with all your heart, you may. Underline that. If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. The requirement for salvation is not purely confession. is not even an acknowledgement of Jesus Christ. But it's a believing in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that He raised from the dead, and now is capable of providing to you salvation. And when we believe that in our heart, it changes who we are. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down to the water, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing, but Philip was found in Astos. And the passing through, he preached in all of the cities till he came to Caesarea. Now, I am not going to try to explain this to you. (laughs) There is no explanation as to he was carried away. Apparently, what Scripture indicates is that he was supernaturally transported from this place to the city of Astod, which is what Astos is. This type of supernatural occurrence is not something that we see common in Scripture. But then again, God can do anything that He wants. I'm sure that it was very strange for this Ethiopian eunuch to come up out of the water and Philip to be gone. But it doesn't say, and he wondered and he pondered and he got all bent out of shape and he was concerned and he didn't know if what happened was real. He said, no, no, no. He went on his way rejoicing. He had gotten everything that he needed out of Philip. He had gotten everything that he needed. He had gotten a, a clear picture of who Jesus Christ is. He had placed his faith in Jesus Christ, and he had now received and committed his life to Jesus Christ. And because of that, it says that he went on rejoicing, even in a situation that would have blown his mind. Oh, it blew his mind, all right, because from this point on, we know that throughout history and even to today that there is a Christian influence in the regions of Ethiopia, most likely because of this instance. Philip didn't see that coming. This guy didn't see that coming, but God did. And while I'm sure it was strange, it happened because Philip said yes to God. Now, I don't know what God has for you guys in your life. I have enough time trying to figure out what God wants me to do. Okay? But here's what I know, is that if you guys will say yes to the Lord, if you'll ask Him to open doors. He will. Now, be ready for it, though, because it'll come in ways... You, 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 <laughs> we have a tendency to say, Lord, I want you to open this door. That one right there. Because we think we know what's on the other side of that door. So, Lord, you open that door, and I'll walk through it. And the whole time, this door over here is open. And we're still looking at this door. And the Lord's going... <clears throat> open door over there i know lord but open this door lord i want you to open this door if there's an open door don't walk run for that door ask the lord to provide you with an opportunity to be able to do what only he can do in you and then be ready to be amazed because he will amaze you by saying yes to the lord That's the key. And guys, we all want to be part of something. Right now, we're living in a world that is messed up. Anybody notice that besides me? All right. The world is messed up. And there's not any one of us here, I would hope, there's not anybody here that is not thinking in your heart and in your mind, I wish there was something I could do about it. Is that everybody here? Does everybody here really believe you wish there was something you could do about how messed up everything is? There is. Ask the Lord to open a door and say yes. I don't know what that means. I have no idea what it means for you. But I know that God will be faithful to use you if you will ask Him and if you'll say yes. Amen?